With the first defence of the America's Cup by the Royal Perth Yacht Club underway, the most talked about place in the West is Fremantle. And tonight's World About Us, a TVW7 production, is about its history. In the 1820s, the first settlers arrived with a rather romantic vision of what Fremantle would look like, but the reality was less attractive and for some very disillusioning. The faith of the first governor, Captain Stirling, in the settlement did not waver, and he pleaded with the British government to improve the conditions for those early West Australians. They didn't. Convict labour was introduced into WA at the request of an influential few, large pastoralists, big merchants and publicans. It only lasted from 1850 to about 1865, but it did increase the size of the settlement from 5,000 to 30,000, and it did halve the wages of those already struggling settlers. The physical presence of the prisons was and is a focal point in the town of Fremantle. The port city developed around the wharf. The harbour, which operates so well today, is the result of the planning of C.Y. O'Connor, an exceptionally clever and far-sighted man who was misunderstood by the masses but supported by the great Lord Forrest. We're fortunate so many have fought to retain the old buildings of Fremantle because it is today a fine example of a port city in the Victorian style. It's a thriving place now, alive with the activity that surrounds the cup. But even if the cup doesn't stay, the charm that is Fremantle will. Stand by to set the mainsail! Take away, south, south, west. Aye, aye, sir. The challenge of the America's Cup. Eleven men the very latest in technology and that unbending determination to succeed. That same courage and commitment characterized the journeys of the early settlers more than 150 years ago. Just like the 12 meter yachtsmen of the 1980s, the seafarers of the 1820s put their faith in the totally unknown. That faith was based on a promise, the promise of a new life in a new land. The Dutch had made the trip more than a century before, naming the River Swan after the black birds that fascinated them. Led by Captain William Vlaming, the Dutch mounted various expeditions during their stay to determine the worth of this mysterious great southern land. But their reports were not as enthusiastic as those tended by Captain James Stirling in the late 1820s. HMS Success was the vessel which carried Captain Stirling out to this area in 1827 to do the initial surveys of the area. He produced glowing reports about the river, about the land surrounding it, and about the harbour of Coburn Sound. The literature that the settlers read reflected Stirling's romantic vision about what Swan River would look like rather than what he actually saw. Even after such a long and dangerous journey at sea, the drama was not over for Captain Stirling and the new arrivals, for the tasks they now faced were simply daunting. Immediately the protest came and the Colonial Secretary's office files, the early files from late 1829 and early 1830, are full of uh, letters from the settlers complaining about being let up the garden path, essentially. And so there was immense disillusionment and the letters started to go back to England and were printed in regional and local newspapers. It seems a complete burlesque altogether, not a farce, for they are generally laughable. But all here is really and truly cryable. You will think I'm giving you a woeful description, but you, in England, can have no idea of what is going on here. Still, we live in hopes that something may turn out better. As time went by, the beach at Arthur Head became dotted with tents and makeshift shelters. The adjacent dunes, stripped of their vegetation for firewood, soon turned Fremantle into a dusty, even more inhospitable shanty town. 
And with the blowing sands came drunkenness and general dissatisfaction. But from shaky beginnings, the settlement at last seemed to take some shape. But more help would be required if it was to reach its full potential. And so it was that in 1834, the British Under Secretary was visited by a very desperate Captain James Sterling. Word of the troubles at Fremantle had travelled quickly. It is true that there are problems with the colony. Many of those who are seeking a new life have become dissatisfied. They have given up. More and more are leaving. We must act quickly to save Swan River. Sterling was undeterred. His faith in the potential of Fremantle never wavered. And so, gentlemen, I put it to you that it is not too late for the colony. I plead with you not to ignore the undoubted wealth that is there, and I request your assistance. With foresight and sense, I now believe, more firmly than ever before, that the colony will become a place of great importance. The Undersecretary listened intently to Sterling, but his answer was typically non-committal. Finally, Captain Sterling, we want to thank you for your proposal. The undeniable faith and hope you have reflected is, to say the least, impressive. I want you to know that my minister will fully consider what you have presented today and that we will contact you in the future with an answer. Sterling's plea was essentially in vain. Sure, they provided him with a strength and military presence, but none of the things the colony so urgently required was forthcoming. Clashes between the Aborigines and the white settlers had become commonplace. The Aborigines found the colonists would not share their valuable commodities the way they had been forced to share their fish and kangaroos. And it's sadly recorded that all Sterling did with his contingent of men was to ride south to the mouth of the Murray River and attempt to wipe out the people they called treacherous natives. Many Aborigines were imprisoned. Others fetched firewood for the settlers. Their world had been completely overturned. Ten years after the settlement of Fremantle, the Aboriginal population was riddled with alcoholism and other diseases. Today, the impact of their integration with the early settlers remains. In the same ten years that saw the virtual decimation of these people, the colony advanced slowly under the burden of this and other problems, not the least of which was the rugged, unforgiving coastline. The West Australian coastline does have onshore winds and it's, it has uh, a little in the way of havens for ships. So if a ship gets into trouble, it's difficult for it to find a, a place to avoid uh, disaster. So they would go out in, in very dangerous conditions and um, subsequently uh, vast numbers of people were, were drowned. Help! Effectively they were sailing blind because there were no adequate charts to show where the reefs and other hazards were. As the frequency of sea traffic increased, the reef-pocked waters claimed more and more vessels. Many a ship laden with goods and dedicated crew sank to a mortary grave. Ships' logs and captain's notes, documents full of tales of mystery and adventure of brave men and buried treasure. Tales recounting the triumphs and tragedies of sea voyages in the early 1800s. But of the gem and a crew, the story remains unfinished. It was about sunrise. The gem was heading in from the south with a favorable wind behind her. The weather was fine, the seas were smooth, all sails were set and she was well clear of Rocknest Island's treacherous reefs. There were no signs of danger. Those on board the gem and the lonely man of the lighthouse had nothing to fear. Continuing on his morning routine, the keeper left his observation post to attend to other routine duties, and after a short time, began the long climb upwards to the top of the lighthouse. 
But in his brief absence, something mysterious had occurred. Returning to his post, he looked out across the ocean, fully expecting to once again pick up the gem in his sights. He quickly became a worried man. The gem had simply disappeared. Another chapter of Fremantle's colourful maritime history was opened when a barely equipped but nonetheless effective whaling station was established below the roundhouse. At the time, the biggest and most distinctive building in the settlement. The whalers, like so many farmers of the ocean that followed them, discovered and cultivated a living beneath the waves of the vast Indian Ocean. Their tools and methods were at first primitive, but in time a jetty was built and by the 1840s, whaling was a booming industry. In a project undertaken by the local council, tons of earth were excavated in a bid to discover more about the layout and construction of the whaling station buildings on Arthur Head. Archaeologists came from all over the world to scrape and fossick in deep pits walled in by layer upon layer of history. Well, the object of the excavation is to define the limits of the historical material that we've got buried under the ground here. Fremantle City Council are redeveloping the area and uh, they want to make sure they don't disturb anything that's of cultural value. Their findings were predictable. An 1851 penny, bottles, some buttons, many pieces of shattered china and the tragic realization that much of what they were looking for would never be found. Unfortunately, when we got down to bedrock here, we found it was under about one and a half meters of water table. This is the base of the jetty, the beginning of the jetty. The rest of it's the part that we were really interested on is possibly a hundred meters further out to sea and gone for good now. By the 1840s, other industries had sprung up in the port. The docks had come alive with activity as loads of wool and sandalwood were shipped out. Industry flourished and soon portside business was booming. More and more ships pulled in and an increasing volume of produce was shipped out. Today, Fremantle Harbour operates smoothly and efficiently. This outstanding engineering achievement is a fitting tribute to the foresight of one man. That man was C.Y. O'Connor and he worked tirelessly in a bid to achieve his vision for Fremantle and the new colony. He worked under intense pressure and sometimes outright ridicule. He was considered mad, with outlandish plans that surely could never be achieved. I think Western Australians have always had difficulty recognising talent in their own midst and uh, we tend to be a society which thinks first that talent lies outside Western Australia and it always comes as a surprise to West Australians to learn that perhaps some pacemaking activities are taking place within Perth. So I think O'Connor generated ideas from within Western Australia and I think these were found to be far-fetched. Uh, one could say that he had a very difficult time of it. Now against that I think one has to say that O'Connor was very strongly supported by the most powerful man in Western Australia, Sir John Forrest. There's no indication that Forrest wavered at all. Forrest thought big. He was a big man and he thought big. And uh, he wanted to be remembered um, for producing great things for Western Australians. So I think O'Connor did enjoy a fair amount of very strong support. Now, whether that was sufficiently strong to assist him psychologically to survive the, the other criticisms, who can say? The groundswell of opinion against O'Connor had depressed his staunch spirit to breaking point. His final diary entry reflects a feeling of anger and despair. The Coolgardie scheme is all right, and I could finish it if I got a chance in protection from misrepresentation, but there's no hope for that now, and it's better that it should be given to some entirely new man to do. I feel that my brain is suffering and I'm in great fear of what effect all this worry may have upon me.
lost control of my thoughts. O'Connor's death was a great tragedy, but his legacy was a remarkable one. His far-fetched schemes became realities, succeeding under the most difficult of conditions. And out of that success came a tough new breed of worker, the Lumper. The men who worked the wharves led tough lives. There's no question about that. We well, were good, honest, hard-working, and very likeable people, very genuine. Couldn't find them any better on the Fremantle Wharf of those days. You had to be tough to survive. There is a myth about Australia that the essential Australian, the stereotype Australian, is an outback country person. Tall, lean, bronzed, male, very independent minded, fairly aggro, uh, can do anything with a piece of wire, great improviser, has all those qualities. But in fact, to survive in an Australian town in the 19th and into the 20th century, you had to be pretty tough. And the city bred its own toughness. You had to be uh, fit and able to do the work, or you didn't get the job. That's all there was to it. The big fit and able men would get preference over the work because it was hard work in those days. The men of the wharves earned the respect of the community, and Fremantle became a bastion of unionism. To this day, it remains a Labour Party stronghold. Men would stick together and strike together, and if anyone stood in their way, they would pay. April 1919, the word went out. The police were on their way to the harbour with scab labour. But I remember that role, uh, that was on a Sunday morning that riot started. And the man come running with a kerosene tin, beating it through every street, calling the lumpers that, you know, were still in bed to get up and come to the wharf. My father told me he was in it. He told me that they had to try to chase these uh, national volunteers off the wharf. The, the police uh, was, they were uh, shuttering them and trying to get them aboard the ships to work. And the Warpies were trying to stop them. Fremantle was just a, a, a fire with, with the, the lumpers and all that. And, and on the Monday night, we were coming out from work. We used to come around the town way. And when we come down, we saw the, the, the police on horseback coming up high street and chasing the lumpers. And the church of England had a fence around us. They were uh, old-fashioned poles, narrow, narrow with points on the top, and every one of them was pulled off, beating the police with them. And we got frightened. We run back and come out, uh, out the back way. We wouldn't go into town. We were that frightened. Oh, well, there were sticks and stones and pickets and batons, and the police were uh, interfering with them. And when they got near the scabs, they entered one with a baton. The police put the baton on them. And uh, these wharfies picked up blue metal or anything they could get. And they damaged a lot of policemen, but they ne never come on the wharf. The riots witnessed many injuries, including the death of one young worker, Tommy Edwards, who was given a martyr's funeral, the biggest ever seen in Fremantle. The rift between the constabulary and the wharfies healed with the years. But the memory of the day known as Bloody Sunday lives on. By the middle of the 19th century, the conditions in the colony had again deteriorated. Many dreams of success had been washed up. Many plans had failed. What the colony needed most was a large, cheap labor force. Back in England, the British government desperately needed a place to accommodate the growing criminal population. And so in June 1850, the first cargo of convicts arrived in Fremantle waters. The able young entrepreneurs of Western Australia got a tremendous boost by the presence of convicts and the injection of British money. So the population moved from 5,000 in 1850 to 
30,000 or so 20 years later. A massive boost to the colony. It saves it, in fact. But many of the people were not convinced that convicts were the answer. At the time the convicts were sent, there was opposition. Most of the women of Fremantle and Perth were against having male convicts in Western Australia. They feared for their lives and their reputations. It was a very difficult thing for the women and children of the colony. Many of the uh, male labourers didn't want convicts to come either because they knew that their wages would drop by 50% the moment the first boatload of convicts arrived and that's precisely what happened. There was a shortage of labour in the 1840s and that the Western Australians to overcome a shortage of labour asked the British government to send convicts to provide that labour. That implicates us all in the decision to bring convicts to Western Australia but serious historical research has shown in the last few years that in fact only a handful of West Australians ask for convicts and that handful were the large pastorals and employers of the York area, the big merchants who had a vested interest in trade increasing from the presence of convicts and from, as you would expect, the big publicans too. More convicts, more booze drunk and the profits up and so forth. So the petitions to bring in convicts, in fact, only have a few names on them, but it was a very powerful lobby, a very powerful lobby in London. But Fremantle physically changed during the convict period, and it meant that wherever you were in Fremantle, you looked up at these huge structures of imperial authority. So if you were a, an ex-convict, you knew who ran Western Australia, and you lived under the shadow of the great jail. But this didn't intimidate all the, the convicts, and Fremantle's tradition of working class uh, protest begins, I think, from this period. By the 1860s, the British had established many other penitentiaries. The stream of convicts to Fremantle quickly dwindled. By 1865, the only offenders sent here were the unfortunate Irish political prisoners, the Fenians. Some years later, in an escape that had all the sophistication of a modern-day crime, six men escaped to freedom and a new life in the Americas. A noble Welsh and commander was called Catalpa, they say. She came up to Western Australia and took six poor Fenians away. The escape started in the United States. Um, why these fellows were here, they came on the last convict ship, the Hugomont, in, in, in 1868. And they were all political prisoners. You cut them in Western Australia till their hair began to turn grey. When a yank from the States of America came out here and stole them away. If the convicts were out on working parties all the time, the thing was, how the heck do you get them out? So they had elected to, to send two gentlemen, Breslin and Desmond, it was Irishmen from the United States who arrived in Fremantle. So these guys had plenty of opportunity to find out who, who, who the convicts they were going to rescue were and then make, make some contact with them. And they did this and let them know that help was coming. In the meantime, back in the United States, they found a brilliant sea captain named Captain Anthony. And they bought him a boat, which was the Catalpa, and they asked him if he would embark upon this journey of rescue, and he said he would. So come on, you screw orders and gamers. And one day, looking up the shipping notes, at the, at the approximate time appointed, they saw where the Catalpa had arrived and Fremantle. Captain Anthony was to come up here. Breslin had surveyed the scene best off the coast of Rockingham. He was used to hiring the best coaches and horses in town. He would arrange for the prisoners to be out on work release. Uh, he would uh, get them into the coach and horses. He had clothing prepared, and um, they would make their escape to Rockingham, which wouldn't be that difficult. Difficult, but not that difficult. The thing was that Captain Anthony had to have his boat crew ashore there waiting for them, then row them out, and they had to escape past Rockingham. Um, this was all arranged. Captain Anthony paid his part. Breslin hired the best horses in town. He'd, had, he'd enlisted the support, of course, of other Irish ticket of leave men in town who, who were giving their um, support. He'd hired the best coach and horses in town, but they made a, a muck up of it at the stables and he got the worst ones. They'd hired them out for a regatta. So, or, or, or overnight, his plans, he was left without the fastest horses to the worst ones. 
ones nobody wanted. But he still managed to have his, by good organisation and maybe a bit of bribery, I don't know, the six military prisoners were in a work gang, easily contacted, easily put in a horse and cart up in Hampton Road and galloped off down to Rockingham with Breslin and Desmond. Let's go. So come on, you screw waters and jailers. Remember, first brigade to pay. Take care of the rest of your feet and so the Yankees will steal them away. On reaching Rockingham, the boat was waiting for them. Captain Anthony had played his part. They boarded the boat and the watcher at Rockingham said, what are you going to do with the coach and horses? And they yelled out, you can have it. So quickly the police were alerted that, that some, obviously some convicts had got away. The Georgette had arrived, which was our only steamer which used to ply between Albany and Fremantle. And the police commandeered that and they took off after the Catalpa. Armed with bold warriors, the Georgettes went out those poor yanks to arrest. But she hoisted her star-spangled banner saying, me, I guess. They overtook the Catalpa and they demanded that it surrender the prisoners it was carrying. The, the Captain Anthony just sailed on as obviously he was going to pay no attention to them. They fired a shot across his bow and said, hand over the prisoners or we'll sink you. Captain Anthony then had to call their bluff. He hoisted the American flag and he, all he replied was, that flag protects me. Our fellas had a hurried conference on board and thought perhaps it was a bit big of us to take on the United States at that time and we decided to let them go, and we pulled away, and they sailed on. There's something about Fremantle that engenders respect for those who have been here before us. The architecture has become known and admired worldwide. It is regarded as a fine example of a port city in the Victorian style. And the fact that it is still intact and largely cohesive has astonished visiting architects. They talk about it being unique. They talk about it being a miraculous survival. Um, they talk about it being a, a place which is relatively unknown uh, in architectural circles overseas. They wonder, at, just as you have, as to why it's still here and delight that it is. The preservation of Fremantle has been due to the concerted efforts from various groups. But to understand its very special qualities, you need to go back to the early beginnings in the colony and to the jewel in the crown of Fremantle, the Roundhouse. It took four and a half months to build and stands today as the most distinctive landmark in Fremantle. That it stands at all is due to the fickle winds of fate rather than the consciousness for preservation. For in 1922, a tender of £10 pounds was asked for its demolition. But the harbour master objected, saying that his house next door would be blown away by the gale force winds. After the convict period, the progress of the colony languished. The imperial government held back vital funds, virtually strangling Fremantle's further development. The trade was dull, the unemployed were standing around in both Fremantle and Perth. There was still the legacy of the convict period. Uh, companies were going bankrupt, including uh, the Stanley Brewery, later the Swan Brewery, almost went bankrupt. You wouldn't think that possible, but it almost did. And so it was a very difficult time. And in, by 1888, complete depression came over Western Australia. A crucial year. But a sudden boost was on the way, and for the colony, it could not have come at a more opportune time. Gold. The irresistible temptation to find it brought thousands of hopefuls to Western Australia, and Fremantle shared in the prosperity of those hectic golden years. While the focus of the gold rush was hundreds of kilometres away in the gold fields of Kalgoorlie, it wasn't long before its effect was felt down the line here in Fremantle. There was, all over again, confidence and optimism. The place went through a major building boom, and its distinctive architecture is still overpoweringly evident today. By 1910, Fremantle was a thriving port and known as the gateway to the Golden West. The early convict buildings were now overshadowed by large emporiums. 
banks, offices, and stately homes. In the rush of the 1890s, uh, a lot of new facades were tacked onto old buildings. In, in fact, they're not total buildings, many of them. They are just facades with earlier generation of building behind. That was done in, in the uh, 60s and 70s, when thoughts of preservation were very rudimentary, when it was uh, a bold step forward to even consider keeping facades in order to uh, maintain the streetscape and the townscape. It's a, as you can see, a, a bit of a stage set left with new building going on behind it. It's happening in two or three places around the town. Uh, we're a bit concerned now, of course, that it might happen throughout the town and leave us with a complete stage set rather than the guts of the town. Hollywood? Well, not exactly. Fremantle's a long way from Beverly Hills. But in 1935, a would-be mogul created an epic entitled Secret Agent. The fight to ensure Fremantle remains relatively untarnished by progress has been somewhat less humorous. There is a long history of, uh, of times when Fremantle was about to be bulldozed and, and rebuilt. And for various economic circumstances, wars and depressions, it missed out on that great development boom that's gone through most of our other cities and left us intact. Many residents feared the arrival of the America's Cup would signal the departure of Fremantle's character. Oh, yes, they've done a lot since, uh, since Bondi won the cup. The, the, and there used to be a muses boat shed just down a few streets. Well, that's all gone. So it's all in for Fisherman Harbour now. I never thought, and I said to the associates that I knock about with, I said, the Bondi wins this race, we'll be well in it. And I, I didn't expect it to be the magnitude it is, though. I thought it would be about half as good as it is now. But it's, it's more than I expected, far more than I expected. I didn't expect to be knocking old places over and building new places and rejuvenating old places. Look at the Esplanade Hotel. Have you been down there to see that? That was a tuppenny apenny joint until the Bondi won that race. And Fremantle had one way streets every other goddamn thing now since they started. So I never expected this, never. There has been tremendous pressure on, on the place in the last 12 months. It's done a lot of good in the sense of uh, encouraging people to smarten themselves up and tidy up their premises. There's been a lot of painting done, a lot of refurbishing of interiors and so forth to very good effect. It's had that in um, I think the danger could be that uh, it goes too far, uh, too fast perhaps. Fremantle is a slow moving place. This is why we've still got so much of it left. What we are seeing is the sort of renewal in Fremantle that to some extent we saw in the 1890s and 1900s a tremendous burst of building activity which frightens some, dismays others and excites still more. And I think that it is too early, here I am the cautious historian, to say whether all this flurry of activity and injection of capital is going to harm Fremantle in the longer term. I have a suspicion that it won't and that Fremantle will not only survive, but prosper magnificently.
Fremantle was thousands of miles from the front line. It didn't take long for the effects of World War I to get here. Many men, some of whom never returned, passed through this port on the way to war. And of course, Fremantle men had to leave wives and families behind to take up arms for the country. It was left to the women to shoulder the responsibilities. And they played a vital behind the scenes role in a conflict that worried the entire world. They were doing a mighty job, the women. They were doing a mighty job because they took the place of a lot of men in driving trucks and things like that. The women did a lot of that during the war years. And I think that was the start of the women, the women being what they are now. Oh, the, the troops used to leave for Mantle. And that's what you, you could go down and see them off, but that, that's all there was. All the soldiers passing through, but there was no excitement much about it. Oh, because we were young then, we didn't fear anything. We never thought of the war. Although the possibility of invasion was remote, Fremantle was enveloped in a fear of war that still exists today. By the end of the first great war, that fear was followed by hard times eventually the depression oh why don't you work like the other men do how the hell can i work when there's no work to do no one was spared from the devastating effect of the depression the cues for work grew and men struggled to feed their families often i'd go down there for days at a time and never get a job three times a day and you could take on any, I would take on any work that was offering. And a lot of fellas wouldn't work coal. And I earned most of my money on the waterfront on coal, working coal. But a lot of people wouldn't have it on because it was dirty. But I would do anything, as long as I got paid. The proudly independent wharfies were now forced to endure humiliation at the hands of the man in the bull ring. You would all stand in a ring. He would stand in the middle and everybody facing him. You. If he didn't like you, he would make it deliberate. You. He'd pick up the man on the left hand side of you. you. And then he'd pick up the man on the right hand you. side. And he'd leave you there, standing. They had the power of, well, let's say life and death. And if you got the job, then good. You. If you never got a job, well then there was no pay. While World War I was remote and perhaps at an age when the armed conflicts of the world was considered a romantic notion, World War II was closer and more threatening. For the first time since Stirling ordered trenches dug around that 1829 settlement, Australians were considering a home front. this broadcast to bring you a special bulletin from the newsroom. Japanese naval, military and air forces launched widespread attacks without warning yesterday morning on British and American territories in the Pacific and on Thailand. The sudden onslaught was apparently designed to achieve knockout blows. Bombers raided Singapore, the central point for British forces in far eastern waters and the city regarded as Australia's northern fortress. Fears now exist that the Japanese may focus their attention on Australian shores. Up and down, up and down. As we went forward, we passed the native stretcher bearers bringing the wounded back. <laughs> oh well, at least we wouldn't have to walk back. Like meeting your future face to face. The Second World War saw Fremantle become an important strategic naval base for the American fleets. They put all their guns ashore. And as they put their guns ashore, they mounted them right along the wharf in between the sheds because they thought the Japanese would be coming down and they were ready for it. The Americans, all Americans, and uh, the, uh, uh, the wharf was lined up with guns. 
You had to get a pass to get on the wharf in those times because, well, supper days, I suppose they expected, but you had to get a pass to get on the wharf. If you didn't show your pass, you didn't get on. The arrival of the American forces boosted the local economy, and for the first time, US troops walked the streets of Fremantle. Yes, the Americans, see, they came here the soldiers come first and then the sailors come after. And of course, the girls went mad with the sailors. But that wasn't the last of the Americans. And Fremantle remains one of the most popular shore leave destinations for the US Navy. I think the fear that a, an overseas or foreign power might do something in this part of the world goes back a very long time. And of course, latterly, the perhaps growing confrontation between the Americans and the Russians and the knowledge that West Australians have that the submarines of both powers are operating off Fremantle shows that we have a very long history of being, I think, concerned about what foreign powers might do to us. And it's just ingrained in Western Australians to be concerned to, on the one hand, welcome the existence of a big friend and on the other, to be worried about the implications. I think that goes back as far as the beginning of Fremantle. And those early fears of invasion have manifested themselves in anti-nuclear sentiments. Today, the visiting fleets are greeted with a mixture of open arms and angry protests. I think that the stakes are much higher these days in terms of uh, the capacity of international powers to wreak destruction on a place like Fremantle. But we have to live with Fremantle, in Fremantle, around Fremantle, just as generations of Western Australians had to do, with that possible knowledge that one day it could be the scene of a major catastrophe in international affairs. All either side needs is one Poseidon submarine. They got 50,000 warheads which they do not need. They have to start to go. The arguments that you give me are no longer valid. We've been hearing those arguments for the last 25 years, and we are now on the precipice of extinction. It's a debate that will probably never be fully resolved. The peace movement will continue to highlight Fremantle's role as a part-time shelter and holiday home for the visiting American fleets. They will point it out with the same vehemence and faith that the American and Australian governments use when they're refuting that Fremantle is a military target. No one but no one will ever know whether they're right or wrong. Except if that day, that fatal day becomes a reality. These people have come to our country knowing that hard work and a democratic way of life will pay dividends in terms of happiness and security. For many immigrants, Fremantle was their first taste of Australia, their first port of call and many elected to stay and start their new lives here. Well, I think it's very important to understand that Fremantle has always been an immigrant's society, that waves of migrants have given Fremantle its character, and it is a recognisable character. It is distinct from Perth, there's no question about that. It is probably, in Australia, now quite unique in its uh, social and ethnic mix. And the fact that it's a port, I think, uh, has helped enormously. Since the 1920s, migrants from Central and Southern Europe, and particularly Italy, have made their way to the port city. They brought with them a long tradition of seafaring. And through their skills and experience, Fremantle's fishing industry was born. Well, when I came here, I remember there couldn't be more than about, say, 15, 20 boats altogether. If you could take in what the industry, the fishing industry, has brought to Fremantle, it's enormous. More than the bloody wool and the wheat they got here. Fishing for local and export markets has become a major part of Fremantle and still thrives as one of her most important industries today. The impact of various migrant groups on the port will never be erased. There is an unmistakable multicultural atmosphere in Fremantle, and even the latest, if only Temporary migrants are wielding an influence as the port gears for the greatest number of visitors ever seen. On the morning of the 27th of September 1983, the fishermen must have realized they were in for some company in their cozy little harbor. Well, there may have been an expectant smile or even a shudder, 
but few of them would have counted on the magnitude or the type of transformation their harbor was about to undertake. And while they wondered, the whole of Australia, from the Prime Minister down, launched a gigantic celebration. I tell you what, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up to die is a bum. <laughs> Fears that the working class fabric of Fremantle would be lost in a surge of big dollars have gone. The cup is with us and the effects are evident. Now there's a different atmosphere in the whole city, everywhere. There's just a new energy, a fresh energy, a vitality about it. Um, and that, that I think is exciting. Uh, the uh, general run of things is, oh, the boat race, the boat race. That's all they're concerned about. Well, the big spending entrepreneurs are certainly present. Uh, I would contend that uh, Fremantle has always had some big spending entrepreneurs. What we're seeing, of course, is the, the possibility that the big spending entrepreneurs could engulf some of the traditions of Fremantle, both the physical traditions in terms of the buildings we see in Fremantle and the cultural social traditions as well by uh, the ethos of the success ethic uh, dominating all. Whether it works out that way, I think, is a little too early to say. Uh, Fremantle uh, ha does have a sort of sponge-like ability to absorb new influences without being totally transformed. And some of the large entrepreneurs have very strong historical roots in Fremantle itself. And so life goes on for the real people of Fremantle. The artists, the fishermen, the wharfies, the collection of cultures that represents the port city today. Just as the fishermen could not comprehend the changes that were to come when Australia too ended the longest winning streak in the history of sport, it's hard to imagine how Fremantle will be in mid-1987. By then, the yachting syndicates will have taken their millions of dollars of equipment and technology back with them. If Australia is successful in defending the cup, they'll be back soon again, you can bet your life. If not, Fremantle will have at least earned itself a brief berth in world headlands and a prominent place in yachting history books. It will most definitely be a different place for the experience. Just how different is difficult to determine. But whatever the outcome, it's the youngsters of today that'll be shaping the Fremantle of tomorrow.